the story of Finn McCool? No. Do you know who no. Finn McCool is? No. Well, he was a giant. And what country do you think he came from? He came from, he came from Ireland. He was a great, powerful, huge giant Finn McCool was. And he lived in Ireland, well, now way back in those days, of course, Ireland was just all one fine green isle. And Finn McCool was working up in the north of Ireland with a, with a bunch of men. They were trying to build a bridge over to Scotland. And there was no one in the whole world that Finn McCool was afraid of except the Scottish giant, Cuckoo Lane. He was afraid of him. He'd heard that he was as big as a mountain and he didn't ever want to meet him. Well, Finn was uh, up in the north of Ireland. You're trying to build that bridge when the word came that Cuckoo Lane was looking for Finn and he was coming after him. And Finn says, well, I think I better go home. I, I don't know how my wife is doing. I think I better go see my wife. Did you know Finn had a wife? Well, he did, and her name was Una. Mrs. McCool was a fine, brave woman. So Finn comes running home to his wife. And Una says, well, Finn, darling, I know why you're coming home. You've heard that the Scottish giant, Cookie Lane, is after your... That's why you're home, isn't it? And Finn McCool says, yes, darling, Una, and I don't know what to do. I'm that afeard of him. Well, I'll see what I can do to help you, says Una. What have you heard about Cookie Lane? I've heard he's big says Finn, and I've heard that he has all of his strength. This is what I've heard in his finger. Oh, I see, says Una. Now, do you think that you could tell me, Finn, just when Cookie Lane will be paying us a visit? I'll see, says Finn, and Finn takes his thumb, and he puts it in his mouth, and I think he touched it to his wisdom tooth, and when he did that, he could see into the future. And he says, Cuckoo Lane will visit us tomorrow at two o'clock. All right, says Una. Now, this is what we'll do. I, first, I'm going to, to make a magic spell for you. And she takes nine threads of nine different colors, and she takes three, and she braids them. And then she makes a circle. She puts it around Finn's wrist. And she takes three more colors. And she braids them. And she makes a circle, which she puts around Finn's ankle. And she takes the last three threads. And she braids them. And she puts it around Finn's head. And she says, now I know what I'll do. And she goes to all of her neighbors, and she borrows from them an iron griddle. Do you know what a griddle is? No. Well, it's sort of like a skillet. Do you know what a skillet is? Yeah. Like a frying pan? Well, you make pancakes on it. It's real flat. So she gets a lot of iron griddles. And then she makes up a big batch of dough, and she makes cakes with an iron griddle in the middle of each one. And she has a great stack of cakes, and there are some cakes that have no iron griddle in the middle of them. And then she says, well, now, Finn, you know what I think I'm going to do with you, darling? What? Una says, Finn, I think.
think I'm going to have you lie in the baby's cradle. Now, I don't quite understand why they had a huge baby's cradle that was big enough for Finn McCool, the giant, to get in, but they did. So Finn McCool gets into this baby's cradle and he's dressed like a baby and he tries to act like a baby. That's what Una tells him to do. And Finn knows that he best do what his wife says. And then it's two o'clock in the afternoon and the house begins to shake and the land begins to shake. For over the mountains comes Kiki Lane the Scottish giant, and he calls out, Hi there, Finn McCool. And Una steps outside and she says, Ah, oh, hello there, Kiki Lane, giant from Scotland. I'm sorry, but you'll be missing my husband. He's not at home now. But I'll talk to you. What do you want? Says Kiki Lane. Well, says Una, you know, there is something you could do for me, and it would be right neighborly of you if you'd do it. I, I don't have enough water. Could you make me a new spring? I can, says Kiki Lane. And he takes his fist and he goes over to the mountain and he punches it, and he punches a big hole in the rock, and the water comes tumbling down. <gasps> well, now, says Una, that's just fine. I'm so glad you did that. For Could you do something else for me? And Kiki Lane says, what is it? And Una says, well, you see, in the afternoon, the sunlight comes into my house and it makes it a wee bit too hot. Could you move my house around a bit for me? I accord, says Kiki Lane. And Kiki Lane puts his arms around the giant Finn McCool's house and moves it a little to the left. Oh, thank you, says Una. <laughs> and now I know you must be very hungry. Won't you come in and I'll give you a bite to eat? I am hungry, says Cookie Lane. And he comes into Finn McCool's house. And Una says, well, since you're a giant and since my husband Finn is a giant, I figured you could eat Finn's bread. I've just made a big mess of cakes, the, the kind that Finn likes, and I think you'd like to eat them too. So she gives one of the cakes to Cookie Lane. And Cookie Lane says, I'm right hungry, and he <gasps> bites it off the teeth, and he spits out two teeth. What's in this bread? Well, now, says Una, that's just the way my husband Finn likes it. I thought you'd like it too. I'm losing my teeth, says Kiki Lane, but I'll try another one. And he picks up another cake and, um, bites, oh, two more teeth. At this rate, I'll be toothless by sundown. I kind of eat your husband's bread. And just then, Finn McCool in the baby's cradle, he starts crying. There now, baby darling. Here, I'll give you one of your daddy's cakes. And she hands Finn a cake. This one has no iron griddle in it. And the baby eats it up. And Cookie Lynn stares in amazement. How can the wee babe eat that cake that broke all my teeth? What kind of teeth does he have? And Cookie Lynn puts his hand <coughs> in the baby's mouth and Finn McCall bites off his finger. <gasps> oh, screams the giant, I've lost all my powers, all my powers are gone now that my middle finger's been bit off and he runs away back to Scotland. And Finn McCall runs after him. And Finn McCool picks up a great clump of Irish earth and throws it after him. But I'm sad to say, the clod of earth didn't hit Scotland. It came nowhere near. It landed over here. And today it's called the Isle of Man. And of course, after he took out a clump of the earth, there was a big hole left in Ireland. And it be an Ireland filled up with water. And today it's known as Loch Ney. 
And you can see very well that it almost looks as if the Isle of Man would fit right in there, in that hole. And that wasn't all that happened. You see, when Finn McCool picked up this claw to earth and threw it, th there were still people on, on the piece of earth. And there were wee cats on the piece of earth too. And the cats were so frightened that all their tails fell off. You think that's not true? Well, to this very day, all the cats on the Isle of Man have no tail at all. And they are known as Manx cats. And that is the end of my tale. Think that's true? Well, now, a lot of you kids from Brown School have Irish names, right? How many of you are Irish? Just about all of you. Well, I'm not Irish either, and this is certainly a story for, for everybody. Um, now, you know that in this country, um, a long time ago when there were slaves down south, one of the things that it was forbidden for the slaves to do was to learn to read or write. Did you know that? Yeah. yeah. Did you also know that there was a period of time when it was forbidden in Ireland for the children to learn to read? Did you know that? No. Well, about in the 1700s to about 1850, I learned this in Cricket Magazine in the March issue, it was forbidden for um, Irish children to go to school. And all of the land in Ireland was owned by um, lords from England. And they had soldiers that were going around to all the villages to make sure that the children had no schools. But do you think there were schools? Yeah. Sure there were. There were secret, forbidden, underground schools. They were called hedge schools because they would hide in back of the hedges. And in Cricket Magazine, it tells about one of these hedge schools. There was a uh, schoolmaster named Mr. O'Donnell who one day came into a village and announced that he was going to start classes. And a boy named Patrick was very excited to go to school because it had been several years since they had had a teacher. So he and his sister Mary went to meet the rest of the children on the other side of the hedge. And they all got together there and they looked around and they realized that half of the children from the village weren't there. And Mr. O'Donnell said, oh, this is to fool the soldiers. You see, only half of the children are at school today, and today is Tuesday. Now, you children will go to school here on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And the other half of the children will go to school on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So that way, there'll always be children in the village. And the soldiers won't know that we're having classes. Now, a very important job in these hedge schools was to be the lookout. So he would stand on a rock overlooking the hedge and look to make sure that no soldiers were coming. While the teacher taught the children how to read and write, and the teacher would tell them old stories, like the one I just told you about Finn McCool and Cuculain. And they would have slates and pieces of rock to write on the slates, you know, like in the old-fashioned schools, and, and this, except their school was outside. So they might have just written a poem or or an uh, arithmetic problem, and if it started to rain, there it would go. Well, it was getting rather cold, and Mr. O'Donnell said, we can't keep meeting outside like this. It's starting to get to be fall. Does anyone know of a place where we could continue holding classes and we'd be out of the rain? And Patrick said, I know a place. It's, it's a deserted cottage, and the house has no roof, but we could build a fire, and, and it would be a little bit more protected than this. And Mr. O'Donnell said, Patrick, why don't you go check it out? So Patrick went and looked over the house, 
yes, it will do. It's not wonderful, but we, we could hold school here. But when he came back, he heard a lot of noise. And the children were running in all directions because the soldiers had come and they had surrounded Mr. O'Donnell to take him off to prison. But Patrick, or a boy like Patrick, vowed that he would make sure that he learned to be a teacher and would come back and keep on with the secret schools. So that's a true story. It sounds different from the, uh, the other story, right? About the giant throwing pieces of land around. All right, if you're talking about Ireland, you really should talk about some of the fairies. And what are the famous kinds of fairies in Ireland? What do you call them? Irish tales. Yeah, what, are, what are the fairies called? When you see pictures of, of oh, little fairies, what are they yeah. called? Leprechauns. Leprechauns, yes. And the leprechauns are the fairy shoemakers. And the people of Ireland had to be on good terms with the fairies all the time. Now here's a tale. How old it is, I can't tell you. Way back when fairies were still in, in Ireland, which is a long time ago. And there was a young boy named Conal, who was a wonderful musician. Conal of a thousand songs, they called him. He could play the pipes and the harp and the fiddle, but of them all, it was the fiddle he liked best. He could draw his bow this way, and people would laugh. And he could draw his bow that way, and they'd start crying. And he could make mute things, just move around wherever he would tell them to go. Now, when Conal was still very young, there, there were two places. Uh, one place had a fine, big house where the English Marquis lived. And the other place was a tiny little village called Baileywell, where everyone was so poor, they couldn't even afford shoes. Now, the son of the Marquis was named Dormord, and the daughter of the shepherd was Bridget and they fell in love. And the Marquis said, no, you can't get married, you can't get married, but at last he gave in. And they were going to have a big wedding on May Day, on May 1st. And a bishop was coming from Dublin to marry them, and Bridget was going to get a beautiful dress, and everyone in the poor little village was so excited to go to the wedding. And then they all got an invitation to the wedding. They would all be welcome. Everyone who could come with coats to their backs and dresses and shoes to their feet. Shoes. I'm wondering if you can feel the heartbreak in that one word for all those poor people. For the only way you could get a pair of shoes was to buy them from Thomas the cobbler. And he was the stingiest man they'd ever seen in all their lives. They knew they'd never get to go to the wedding for the lack of a pair of shoes. The day before the wedding, who should come over the hills but Conal of a thousand songs with his pipes and his harp and his fiddle. He was going to make all the music for the wedding. And the first person he saw was wee Katie. And she was standing outside her house, crying as though her heart would break. What's the matter, says Conal. What but the matter of shoes, says Katie, to be thinking of Bridget, a bride in a dress fetched from Dublin by the Marquis and a bishop thrown in, all that to be missing. <laughs> now, don't cry, says Conal. If you cry all night, it's a poor manner of girl you'll be tomorrow if, if a pair of shoes should just happen to come to your house so you could go to the wedding. And Conal went from house to house giving them a bit of hope that maybe they could go to the wedding the next day. And then Conal went to the cobbler's shop and he looked in the window and there were rows and rows of shoes, big shoes, tiny shoes, fancy shoes, stout shoes, all ready for anyone who had the money to pay for them. Fine lot of shoes, said Conal, but what's the use of empty shoes? <laughs> And he opened the door. And there was Thomas, making more shoes. Ah, Colonel, you can sit by my fire and mind my shop for me while I go across the street to the tavern to drink my mug. 
And Connell winks at the shoes as he walks to the fireplace and he puts his fiddle under his chin and he starts to make a song. Oh, what song is that? Says Thomas. Oh, it might be his tune. I'll play at the wedding, says Connell. What name would it be called? Says Thomas. Well, says Connell, I'm, I'm thinking of calling it a tune for putting enchantment on shoes, any sort of shoes. Now, if Thomas had had his wits about him, he would have got to the bottom of such silly talk right then, but his shoe was done and he was thirsty, so he runs across the street to the tavern. <laughs> Connell slams the door <laughs> and he walks over to the shoe. And he gets a wild, mad look in his eye. And he starts singing to the shoes. Hey there and hi there, we shoes are you hearing me? Tramp along to Bailey Wheel for soon I am fearing me. The master will have his protein to run and be back any minute. And tomorrow there's a wedding and there'll be no Katie in it. And if you'd been there. You would have seen this tiny pair of shoes all by themselves jump off the shelf and walk over to the door. And Connell opened the door and pointed the way to Katie's house. He slammed the door. Hey there and hi there, big shoes, are you hearing me? And he sang the big shoes off to Thaddy and the soft shoes off to Granny Da and a very big comfortable pair to Patrick. <laughs> He sang a pair of shoes off to every person in Bailey Wheel so they could all go to the wedding. And the shelves were as empty as a harvested field. <laughs> and Connell went over and peered into the tavern and there was Thomas as drunk as a lord. <laughs> He'll not be knowing if he has any shoes at all, says Connell. Now maybe you're thinking that's the end of the story. But to what make but a poor ending. On the next day, when Thomas was sober and he had no shoes at all in his cobbler's shop and, and every person in Bailiwill had a new pair of shoes, he'd be clapping them all in jail. But maybe you're forgetting what night of the year it was. From the fairy wrath above the town trooped hundreds of the gentle people with their little green caps and their little red hats. They all went right into the cobbler's shop with the leprechauns in the middle. And the leprechauns set to work. And the other fairies were handing them bits of leather as fast as could be. If you'd listened, you would have heard the soft tap, 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 bing <laughs> of their wee hammers. And if you'd had the courage to peer in at the keyhole, you would have seen the leprechauns making a pair of shoes exactly like every one that Connell had sent off to Bailey Whale. And when they'd finished, all the fairies laughed and they went to dance till the moon had gone down behind the rain. Now here's the strangest part of the tale. When Thomas came back, he could never tell the difference between his own shoes and the fairy shoes. For a shoe was not but a shoe to him, something made of leather to be show, sold for five shillings, sixpence halfpenny, but not so for those who came to buy. They'd come in and they'd try on a pair of his shoes and their feet would be pinched so tight that they'd kick off those fairy shoes and go looking for another cobbler in another town. And Thomas never sold another pair of shoes till the day he died. And what of the wedding? Oh, well, they all went. We, Katie and Thaddy and Patrick and all of them, made decent enough in their new shoes. And they all looked as long and as hard at the bishop as they liked, so they could tell their children and their grandchildren what manner of creature a bishop was. And at the end of the wedding, Connell played the merriest tunes for them all to dance to. And at last, Connell made a special song for Bridget, the shepherd's daughter, and Dormord, the marquis's son. It was a song 
to lay enchantment on their hearts so that love should last between them till life's end and afterwards. And that's the end of that story. Now those people who were very poor, it could be the same people who went to the hedge schools. And do you know what happened in Ireland in about 1830? These people were so poor that all they had to eat was potatoes. Because it doesn't take much work to grow potatoes, right? You just put them in the ground and they grow. So that was all they ate practically, was potatoes, potatoes, potatoes. And they kept working very hard on the land that belonged to the English lords. But then there was a fungus, a blight, that rotted all the potatoes. And that was the only thing they had to eat. So they all began to starve to death. And what do you think they did? Where did they go? Where did your ancestors go to? To heaven. Well, if they died, they went to heaven, yes. <laughs> but a lot of them came to America because of the potato famine. And that was how they came over here. And uh, it's important to remember all of these different things about Ireland. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you.